Are we are we recording already? Yes. Okay. So yes. hi everyone. Um, since uh, Mark has to give a lecture himself now in India, which is possible, um, he apologized for not joining us. And um, so since this is the first uh, event of the lunch lecture uh, of this new year, I wish you. Uh, all a happy new year and I hope you're healthy. Um, Vanessa had given us a great talk in December last year about housing politics in, in Brazil uh, in the 60s. This was extremely uh, interesting and, and truly exciting. Today, um, you are on the left side then. So um, Dan Batchu will tell us about the culture and power of let's say ideas and the, um, yeah, the the possibility of using new tools, new digital tools to explore ideas. Um, the announcement for today raises the interesting question of whether an architectural company is more than an idea or a story. Um, and uh, Yuval Harari has told us over and over again how powerful and, and, and impactful stories can be. So I think there will certainly be, let's say, some points of connection here, maybe. And I'm very curious to know more. Um, Dan joined our faculty last fall, right? Um, Dan is assistant professor of digital tools, and he's uh, working on big data, um, on the field of big data, computation, uh, and evolutionary dynamics, and how to use all of that to study culture. So um, before coming to Delft, um, Dan was a postdoc at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, he did his PhD at the Illinois Institute of Technology and his master at ETH uh, Zurich. Now he's in Delft uh, and I'm very excited uh, about his talk. Uh, the title of his talk is Ideas, Evolution, Diversity and Urban Geography. So welcome Dan, um, please. All right, thank you. Thank you for this wonderful introduction, uh, Georg. Um, I'm Dan Basu, and I'm going to give the lecture today. And um, research is always uh, difficult to understand because it's research, right? You have to discover something new. Uh, so you have to make something understood. It's not yet understood. And that's why sometimes it's difficult to explain. And uh, seeing this problem, I once started a lecture with a joke because I thought it, it might it might ease up to things. And at, uh, at the end of the conference, somebody came to me and, and said, you know, I, I didn't understand your lecture, but I understood the joke. <laughs> um, so that's something I, um, I wanted to share before I really start. And the other thing I want to share is, because I'm a, an assistant professor of digital tools and um, I had once to explain, and maybe some of you have heard from me this explanation of what is digital compared to analog. And uh, I always come with this, uh, the fist exercise where you make a fist and that's actually the, the analog. And uh, the digital comes in when you open the fist and see, uh, well, you see the fingers, so the digits, uh, Latin digitus, which is why we call it digital. The, the advantage of the fingers is that you can start making symbols by combining and recombining the fingers. And that's why numbers have digits. And so numbers are also a digital system. Why the alphabet is a digital system because you can combine and recombine letters. And the alphabet is a digital system because language is a digital system. Uh, we have sounds that we combine and re recombine. We have words that we combine and recombine. Culture is a digital system. And of course, um, the DNA is a digital system because it has base pairs that we combine and recombine. So there is uh, somehow the realization that all biological life is digital. And uh, that's something that I feel is very rewarding when I'm an assistant professor of digital tools because it literally means that I can do almost anything. Um, but today I will speak about culture and ask this question maybe from a slightly different point of view is culture, uh, cultural life a form of life? And I have prepared here a small video with this title, which I will share right now. 
Uh, there's also a Zoom uh, a YouTube link to this video, which I will give in the chat in case some people have trouble. Here's the link and I will play back the video, uh, which is just 15 minutes and then I'll return to the lecture and um, give some more explanation on actual tools um, that I've been working with um, and um, on more questions. But uh, this video is maybe sort of an introduction. It's a very dense introduction, but hopefully it will change the way you think about culture and about life. Let me now share. All right, so everyone, does, the, does my video, is it visible? Good, very good. Is cultural life a form of life? Several billion people observe the world and exchange messages on a daily basis. You are one of them, and this presentation is one such message. If you consider the sheer scale of communication, it may seem overwhelming. Nevertheless, the immediate outcome is easy to describe. In the big picture, communication creates culture. When you zoom in, you go on to see that within culture there are smaller units that grow and shrink, often independent of each other. Finally, if you keep zooming in, you come to the scale of individual ideas. Each of the previous units holds scores of individual messages and ideas. Thus, in only three steps, we have come all the way from communication to culture and back to ideas. Before we continue, let's make sure we get one thing right from the beginning. Maybe you agree that there is culture and that there are ideas, but you feel that culture is unruly and that there are no natural units that can independently grow or shrink as described before. If you hold this belief, I must disappoint you. The existence of cultural units is well known. Trend scientists call them trends. Social scientists call them social fields. Students of memetics call them memes. Fashion designers call them fashions. And artists and architects call them styles. These matching word pairs show how central the cultural units are to the people who create or those who study them. Last word pair may seem at first to break the rule. Artist and style don't seem to match quite as well as fashion designer and fashion. However, the word style originates from stylus, the Latin for drawing utensil or chisel, which is the one object that has accompanied artists since the beginning of art. Indeed, the insight that there exist cultural units such as styles may be as old as art itself. The next question is how communication, culture, cultural units and individual ideas are related to each other. But maybe you feel that this question is too broad or you think it is irrelevant for you as an individual. If so, imagine a blackout that stops all worldwide communication. Already after the first few hours of blackout, the human world enters a deep crisis. Markets crash, airplanes collide, and cities stop working for their inhabitants. From this thought experiment, you realize that communication is the vital pulse of culture. The more people live on this planet, the more relevant it is to understand what keeps this cultural pulse alive. In medicine, the study of the human pulse has led to the development of straightforward methods to quantify it, regardless of the fact that trillions of cells contribute to its physiological appearance. Let us once more return to the question how communication, culture, cultural units, and individual ideas are related to each other. The answer that I would like to give here has two dimensions. 
cultural reproduction and creativity. By reproduction, I mean that people copy ideas, behaviors, art, architecture. Let us imagine a world where everything is just copy-paste. In many respects, this world is not unlike the real world. In the real world, fashions would hardly exist without models and without people who inspire themselves from the models. Copying also exists in art. Art reproductions have been around for as long as we know that people valued art. The beautiful part about copying, and that's the part that makes culture diverse, is that we don't copy the same thing all the time. We live in a dynamic world, a changing world. Some models are most attractive and people copy their style in a furious frenzy. However, things change. What was initially attractive becomes commonplace. People have a wonderful ability of getting bored and searching for new things. They become curious. Curiosity makes the promise that it will make our life interesting and that it will broaden our horizons. This is why fashions and styles come and go like waves, and this is why there are many waves. The other dimension of culture is that of creativity. Creativity is all about artists who create art, about architects who create architecture, about writers who write, about scientists who make science. Along the path of creativity, we must recognize that reproduction is not always exact. Sometimes reproduction is approximate. Take the example of a scientist. Scientists often reproduce known experiments exactly. They replicate some research to check whether the results are really valid and robust. Other times, the same scientists make changes. They create a new related experiment. The new experiments broaden or strengthen an existing topic of research. What I propose here is that exact and approximate reproduction are parallel channels. The consequence of this proposition is that similar ideas group together, similar experiments create topics of research, similar designs create fashions and styles. You can test this idea on yourself. If I say tree, do you also see leaves, trunks, roots, and forests? If I say building, do you also see windows, walls, interiors, or cities? Many people do. The point is that similar things exist in groups of similar things. Somebody mentions one thing to you and many other similar things come to your mind just by themselves. The things that are in the same group belong together as associations that we make because they reinforce each other to our brain's creativity. This is why the unit of cultural evolution is not the isolated idea, but the group of related ideas. Figuratively, think of a string on a musical instrument, no matter where exactly you pluck the string, it vibrates and sounds in its entirety. Styles are the creative strings of culture. So this is the core of the theory. The next step is to formulate these ideas as a mathematical model that can be empirically tested. Only then w we can know whether the theory makes valid predictions. The good news is that I can save you from doing the math. I already did it for you. My most recent results are published in my article Cultural Life, Theory and Empirical Testing. Let me summarize. First, the concept of creativity does indeed explain why ideas cluster into coherent groups. In the groups, similar ideas come together and grow together. Second, the concept of replication and that of curiosity explain how groups compete with each other and how curiosity broadens our horizons. Curiosity explains the evolution of diverse groups, which is a key component of almost every culture. In some, culture is creative and diverse. 
Putting theory into mathematics has another advantage. The math that my theory of cultural life leads to is nothing else but the core mathematics of life science. Over the last century, two sets of equations in the life sciences have evolved to explain more and more empirical observations. They are now found in many surveys of theoretical biology, and they have also been unified and formulated as one single equation, the replicator-mutator equation. In my case, I ended up with a mathematically equivalent formula. Call it the replication creativity equation. The replicator part of the equation is what I discussed here under reproduction and curiosity. The mutator part of the equation is what I discussed under creativity. So, yes, the answer to the question th that I chose as a title is yes. Cultural life, down to its mathematical details, is a form of life. Cultural life follows paths that are predictable through the equation of life. Finally, what is striking is that many researchers in fields such as sociology and digital humanities used mathematics that are equivalent to mine, too. They used this math as a method of analysis. They figured out that using this math for their analyses of culture was giving meaningful empirical results. And they started to endlessly debate the meaning of those results. At one point, digital humanists did not know how to call the groups of ideas that they found. And so they called them genres. At another point, other researchers called the same groups topics of public discourse. These names certainly broaden the vocabulary already mentioned. They make a great addition to trend, social field, fashion, and style. My interpretation not only shows the real scope of what groups of ideas really are, but it also made new predictions possible. One of my predictions was that groups of ideas have predictable geographical footprints, and I developed a way to test this. Groups of ideas are not random. Many groups create hotspots of cultural life on the map. The center of the hotspots is where reproduction is the strongest. The blur is created through creativity. And multiple groups coexist next to each other, supported by curiosity. The other prediction is that life, including cultural life, tends to oscillate between the mutator and the replicator part of the equation. When the first part is active, there is growth. When the latter is active, there is diversification. And this latter part shows as formation or as recession. Many of these insights require more time to be fully understood. But I am now ready to conclude this video with something big. Let me propose a big synthesis of life. Life science is not just ecology, epidemics, microbiology, linguistics. Life science is also the study of cultural geography, social science, economics, culture and history, architecture, artificial intelligence, psychology. Ultimately, all of these fields study life, in its creativity and diversity. And in all of these fields, the equation of life fosters an important foundation. It will help us to hold together, and united we stand. All right, um, if there are questions now, we can make a questions break, or otherwise I can go on and explain a little bit about how I studied regionalisms. Um, so just um, 
raise your hand or just uh, unmute and say if you have a question. Otherwise, I will reshare and. Yes, Phoebus. Hi. I wanted to ask what's your. Um... Um, how do you define it? How, how you said it's a theory, then you said it's interpretation, but isn't it uh, all uh, hypothetical? Like, what uh, facts do you have that confirm this this uh, hypothesis to make the theory? Oh, very good question. So, um, most of science has two parts: it has theory and it it has some testing. Um, and the testing is mostly empirical. So you're looking at data, whether the data actually, you make predictions and you look whether the predictions hold true. Uh, to test my predictions, I looked at um, um, 50 million pages of, uh, of uh, publications that mentioned the Chicago School during my doctorate. I looked at uh, 2 million something documents mentioning humanities and science during my postdoc. Um, and I also use uh, some of the visuals you've seen before, like um, uh, like the, the line plots. Uh, those are used with Google Books, which are mostly based on a collection of, um, I believe it, it's around 10 million books that, um, that Google and universities initially digitized um, and where you can trace ideas such as science or physical science. And you can see how people start speaking about physical science, how they speak less about it over time and how that is changing. And what makes the theory is actually the connections between the observations. So there's this observation, there's that observation, and the good theory will make the connection. It will tell you how one observation is related to the other and how these observations are related to what we know about the human brain, uh, what we know about um, the way we exchange information, what we know about communication as an individual act. Like I tell something, you listen to it, or you tell something and I listen or respond. Um, so that is, that's the theory part that makes the connections. And then there are the observations uh, that are first predicted and then tested when you actually look into data is it really true the way we think it is? And when you see that happen, you th and it, the prediction turns out right, or it turns out uh, to negate something, you think uh, that you thought it was negative, then you think you're on the right path. Uh, and this will go on until an observation comes that, uh, or many observations come that will have, make you change your mind and improve the theory. I don't know if, does that explain a little bit how? Yeah, yeah, I suppose it's um, very far reaching theories. I mean, it's very broad, so it's gotta be hard to, to tackle all these kind of different um, aspects of all the data mm -hmm. to combine them. But my question is how to make it uh, like waterproof, you know, how, how is this larger than life questions end up in a theory that's actually can be as concrete as possible and using all this data to mm. this end. And I think, you know, there is, for one, there are the experiments that I did myself. And for the other, there's this empirical tool, for example, topic modeling that emerged um, from work like Pierre Bourdieu's uh, to um, digital humanities where they developed this tool Latin, Latin semantic analysis. And the way it was developed is that people just realize when they do, when they process data in some way, it just gives meaningful result. It so, sort of shows these groups of ideas, these styles that we kind of knew any way they were there, but we didn't know why they were there, how they emerged. Um, and there was this tool created that could sort of detect them and analyze them in a corpus of text. Um, and it turned out, it seemed to people that it was doing something right, but many critics were around who said, well, maybe it's just because we are creative when we look at the results and make sense out of them, but they are not actually meaningful. Um, and that was a big question. And it was e eventually tackled because you could use these semantic spaces that were created through the analysis to predict synonyms. 
And, um, and then suddenly it seems like, yes, all right, so you can actually do something practical with it. We don't know what it is, but it works. Um, and when you look exactly what it is, uh, it is, uh, it simulates a creativity and diversification as, as you can see them in the equation of life. And this I find fascinating because it means that essentially hundreds of researchers have used the tool, uh, have, have given the empirical proof of the theory that I'm developing at some point, independently of my work. So they've worked with this um, and their math is, uh, is, uh, is equivalent to what I'm actually saying it would happen. And I think that it's also, the nice part is that now suddenly, because we know it's the equation of life, we have the connections to other things that occur in life. Uh, why, for example, viruses cluster in groups and you can make a vaccine? That's also part of this way in which part of the equation of life where you see they create these, these closed clouds. They don't create a big fog that's going everywhere. They, they create groups of ideas, just the same way in which uh, we have styles in culture. There, there is this creativity that has certain boundaries that are, that are uh, possible. And so suddenly, because we have this math and we have understand the theory, we can make all of these connections that are inside the field that explain what's going on, uh, explain how the um, association matrices that we have in our heads so that help us make associations, how they are connected to the styles and groups of ideas and groups of words and, um, and these being also bigger picture that occurs everywhere um, in biological life or in, in many places in biological life. Does that <laughs> maybe? Yeah, I, I mean, I could go on further. I mean, this is very interesting, okay. especially for the concept of style and how the mediation itself and the reproduction affects the, the, the message. I mean, with style, it's pretty evident because you have all these museums and exhibitions that need to give their stamp to make something called style. Yes. Right? Yes, absolutely. So. For a while, people thought, you know, his, some historians will tell you a style is just a box and you put something into the box and the box is completely arbitrary. But there are, I think that styles are natural units uh, and they are created through, you know, the selectivity that we have. So the, which is part of the reproduction, you know, and, and the creativity that broadens. So it's a steady state between selecting something that's meaningful to us and being creative and broadening the style. And that creates this idea of the, the cloud of, you know, the group of ideas um, that is, is the style. And it's, it's not just styles, it's also fashions and other things that function in a similar process. All right, uh, let me now give a couple of more details on how I um, worked with, um, with regionalisms. And I will just try to reshare again. So how I looked at the geographical profiles of these groups of ideas. And I will now share here. I think this is a method that could be useful to many people. And um, I've given two lectures on this already. And very often, actually at both lectures, I had people who wanted to work on, to use that for their own research. And I'm going to explain now how, how these um, groups have been decoded. Uh, I'm not going to give all details, but I'm going to show the most important things that might be useful, I think, uh, to your research. So we have these, um, I'll call them now regionalisms and how uh, they are studied. And the classical way of studying them is uh, you take a text like the way geographers would study them is they take a text or so mostly a table. They will work with tables because they are they are not linguists, they are geographers. So they will take a ta table and uh, some data and uh, then they will look for uh, place names in those data like Chicago or New York or other place names. They will have a list of place names and try to find the place names in the data. And then they will get new data that is sort of annotated with the place names. Uh, in the case of a text, this could be something like the writer Saul Bellow was a professor at New York University before moving to university to the University of Chicago. And then you process this with the list and then suddenly you have the writer Saul Bellow was a prof professor at New York, which is recognized as a place name. 
and then university is not recognized before moving to University of Chicago and then Chicago is recognized again. Now, in theory, this should work. It works with structured data like a table, the, the type of data geographers usually work with, but it doesn't work as well with language because while well, you realize like New York here is, is actually not New York, it's New York University, which is not exactly the same thing. It has a different location and it's more specific. It, it, it has a place in the street uh, in New York. It's not just New York. Uh, same with Chicago. And of course, New York then could be New York State. In some cases, it could be New York City. Uh, there could be, uh, for example, I'm from Zurich, but Zurich, uh, there is a Zurich in the US. So there is ambiguity. And of course, it could be NYC, meaning New York, and that would not be recognized because it's not on the list. So these are the problems that uh, one would encounter or one actually constantly encounters when one works with this method. And that's the standard method. So in, in the departments of geography or, or urban planning, they will work with, these, uh, with this method. Now, my method is slightly different because um, I work with uh, natural language processing. Uh, and so when I look at the text, I look at it as a natural language item uh, that then the first step is very logical to me. I have to do natural language processing. I have to process the text and understand what's inside, uh, not just uh, filter it through a list of names. Uh, that's very important. And it has not really been done sufficiently because you have to reach the level of natural language processing that can link the text to, a, to an encyclopedia, which would make the disambiguation of homonyms like NYC uh, being New York, like New York being uh, New York State or New York City, uh, but also the recognition of alternative names like NY, uh, NYC, um, and so on. Uh, if you do this and suddenly these problems are solved and you get as an output something different, you get a new text that is in, enriched with additional information. So suddenly um, you have this uh, text and I change it a little bit. I've, the the uh, writer and Nobel Prize laureate Saul Bellow and you'll recognize all of these entities as special entities. So you'll recognize the Nobel Prize, you'll recognize Saul Bellow as a person, you'll recognize New York University as an entity and uh, University of Chicago as an entity. And of course, some of these have dates. For example, Saul Bellow will have date, dates when he was born, when uh, when he went to NYC and so on. And uh, he has a place where he was born and New York University has a place in the street where it's located, uh, same with University of Chicago. So this method is actually giving you much more, um, much more ability to recognize what actually the language means. Um, and it's designed to work with natural language. Um, and so this is eventually how these come into existence, uh, but it's not the last step. So the text has now been augmented with geographical and historical information and so on. But of course we still need to analyze it. So, and which is nice because the, the text is still there. So we can run the entire analysis on the text in its entirety. So we can suddenly recognize the groups of ideas again by looking at the entire text with all of its words or all of those words that we choose to use. Um, and that suddenly creates this completely new uh, possibility of, of looking at regionalisms automatically. So you have the computer, it just runs that for you and then you can look at them, how they, um, they work. Um, I'd like to add one more topic, which might be of current, of present interest today. And that's the idea of transformers and how they are tested. Transformers are the kind of thing that uh, maybe you saw some news a couple of months ago, a robot wrote this entire article, are you scared? Uh, and this is an article where a robot is writing, I'm not a human, I'm a robot, a thinking robot. And then of course it sounds like a human person has written this. And uh, this is maybe fascinating. It's a generative tool. It's called a transformer because you put a lot of text into this tool and it will transform it 
uh, into a new text. So you, it takes the text that you put in and it will create a new text that looks like human written, but on a new topic. And um, working with these transformers has started much earlier. So there was a, a 1960s, uh, for example, tool of a therapist, of a digital therapist that would just ask you a question. It's like a psychiatrist who will uh, talk to you. And so he's saying, how can I help you? I don't know. Uh, try to tell me something about it. No, I can't elaborate. I'm sick. I'm so tired today. Uh, do you have an idea why? Yes, I'm old. Please go on. And so this goes on and the therapist somehow uh, makes the, the patient feel good again. And some patients actually said that they prefer the digital therapist over, over the human. Um, but this goes back even uh, earlier to um, Alan Turing and his idea of an imitation game where a computer would compete against a human and the human would have to recognize whether uh, this is a computer or a human. So it's the idea of creating a perfect illusion. Um, and so many of these tools have gone through this approach of trying to make something that's not recognizable because it's such a good illusion. Uh, they create a text that is just like uh, the human text. And we know of that uh, in art, uh, there's, that's a long-standing discussion. It existed before Turing uh, where artists tried to imitate reality and create a reality that's not recognizable uh, from um, the painting is just like the reality. And we know this in architecture, sometimes we will just use a glass wall uh, to reflect the environment. That's here really a transformer. It takes the outside environment, reflects it. And in an old part of the city, you won't notice that there is this glass because uh, it really just takes up the environment around it. And uh, there is the art about it uh, by Dan Graham where he plays the mirrors. And of course, this create new spaces uh, in, in this garden. So here again, is something like the transformer. Uh, this is how it works. It takes the plant and then it transforms it. But I think that the real big goal would be to reach some point with these um, tools where you can actually create culture like the one I described before. So in human culture, we start speaking with each other. That's my paper, uh, my patent, uh, my presentation. And then suddenly, because we speak together and create these groups of ideas and go into different directions, discover new things and create new discoveries. And the ideal case, I think, would be that the computer, the transformers could also create my paper, my patent, my presentation, and could discuss them together and make new discoveries. This is a test that goes beyond just the illusion. It, it reaches the point where you actually become creative. And it would be very cool because suddenly you could have a problem in, in hospital design that just, let me just pick something. And then you could have a culture of computers discussing this problem and developing new styles of hospital design in response to this problem. You wouldn't need to have uh, that many uh, people and you could just sit back and just let the computers do their work and be sure that you'll have a solution soon. Uh, of course, this is something that is, does not yet work with transformers, but it, in some way it works with computer science where we have actors that explore an environment, an environment and so there uh, we call it reinforcement learning where uh, the actor, the computer makes some actions in the environment and gets a reward and then creates a new solution. And what's funny about this is that if you look at this, how it works, in principle, it also has sort of, sort of the, the blueprint of the equation of life in the background. So let me here return to, to this picture where you have life in the center and you have all of these sciences and and people who actually study life in its creativity and in its diversity and where we're actually bound together and maybe we can help each other be more successful and, and come get further out, uh, do, do new things and um, 
and get where we want to go, reach the understanding of life that we want to have and we need to have in order to proceed. All right, I will at this point probably still have a couple of minutes for questions. Thanks, Dan. Um, yeah, any kind of questions or comments? Okay, I have a question. Hi, Dick. Hi, Georg. Uh, hi, Dan. Hi, hi, Dirk. It's yeah. always provocative. I, I have a, it's a, it's another question. It's a why question. Why is it important to conflate the culture of humans with the one of computers or vice versa? To conflate? What do you mean? Yeah, why, why would we think of them as being the same instead of different uh, realms? Um, it's an <laughs> open question. You, you can treat them as separate items and just study them in their separate ways. But of course, the theory should make a bridge because that's why it's theory, because otherwise you just have the observation. Uh, and if it makes the bridge, it's useful in cases where you learn, for example, neural networks were inspired from neural networks. And initially they weren't good. And now they are very good because we started to learn how you have to train them. Um, and so the question is here, why learning from somebody else? Because you can, uh, and, and because it might help you develop things that you couldn't do otherwise. There is this uh, riddle of, of the machine that, um, imagine you have this machine, the Oracle that tells you the answer to any question you want. It, it tells you the correct answer to any question you want to have. It's like the per and anything you can ask and it will tell you the right answer, but it's not useful. Why? Because you don't know what question you should ask. But isn't it a pity uh, if computers or humans have the same sort of neural networks and ways of working? Why should, nice it? To have, huh? <laughs> Why should it be a pity? <laughs> because, it, <laughs> because it's nice to work with different things. To think of um... yeah yeah there should be different things and of course um you know knowing what is similar can also help us find uh, distinguish things from each other make it make it different make it uh, uh not a neural network make it a, a very different type of uh computer architecture um that certainly um something but i i guess that you will always even in your research you will probably start by taking something existent and then trying to add those those changes yeah. um and so there my interest is is finding the bridges that can make our connections and suddenly if you know there's uh, a process that you observe very well in one field but you cannot observe it in the other because the empirical data maybe is not just the same way or you can't see it quite as well. And because you know the theory is the same, you can start understanding how it goes and piece it together. Um, and I think that a big part of say, economics and uh, evolutionary science um, and, um, and other sciences, uh, bibliometrics or whatever it was, um, were initially connected through where people actually started in one field and applied what they found to the other field. And it was, uh, I think, really over the long run of history, it has actually helped people many times to be able to make these connections across the fields of study. And how, how then do you view assemblage theory or the, the popular um concept of ecologies that are somehow sort of hyper concepts that at least to me seem to try to explain indeed how differences work together in an overall system. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, yes, that's, just, uh, that's probably to a big extent the same thing. So when I'm looking back here 
at uh, this scheme where you have media activity and um, people, how they uh, get bored of ideas. And then when they are bored, of course, you reach this lower point. Uh, and then the boredom is forgotten. And then there's a new chance for a comeback. Uh, that's why the fashions come and go and return. Um, and this graph is the same that you have for an interaction, like say, this is the population of rabbits in the classical case, and this is the population of foxes. And uh, first the rabbits grow and then the foxes come eat the rabbits, but then there are not enough rabbits anymore and the foxes die. And so you have these wobbling up and down and the math is the same here. This, this is the replicator part of the equation. And it, it regulates a lot of the uh, ecological interactions between species. And for example, when you think of uh, say, uh, Yellowstone National Park, initially one, you know, the, the Americans killed the uh, predatory animals like the wolves. Uh, and as a result, because they thought they were not useful, they're just eating away the beautiful animals. Uh, but as a result, the deer started to grow and to grow and to grow and there were only deer. Uh, and that's exactly the reason here. So if you don't have the blue population, you have the deer grow and you have the deer outcompete everything else. The same we have in culture. If you are not able to get bored of one idea or one group of ideas, that group will grow and grow and grow and dominate, and dominate over everything. So you have to have this ability that the, in the ecosystem when the wolf was re in, reintroduced, the population of deer decreased but then there was diversification in the other species. And also in human culture, when we have the ability of becoming bored, that's the predatory animal of culture. We, we prey on, uh, on ideas by getting bored of them. Uh, then suddenly you have the ability of something new can rise. So this media activity broadens through its creativity, creates something new. That new thing would not grow because it's not as strong as the initial idea. But once you have you get bored of the mainstream, the new idea can also start to grow. And so suddenly where you had initially just one idea, you have multiple groups who start existing together and, and uh, interplaying together one with each other. That's the uh, replicator part of the equation. And it, it's the same in ecology. Uh, and I argue it's the same in, in culture based on the data that I've seen, um, I'm quite confident that this is the case. Uh, Dan, um, we have a question in the chat box. Yes. Um, uh, I don't know if you can see it. So here's um, uh, someone is interesting in 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 board machines, which is quite nice. Uh, so oh, the question yeah, is: um, right Do we now. perhaps uh, have to program the machines to get bored so they uh, behave like us? Oh, I would really like that because you know, the, all of those moments where you get those frustrating ends and it never ends. Once you click on something, the machine just learns that you like that and it will not learn that you can get bored of it. And it, it will just bombard you with, with all of those things. And um, yeah, they should really learn to do that. And in, for example, in reinforcement learning, you have to think of that possibility that one solution is found but it's just a local optimum. It's, a, it's an optimal solution when you deviate from it, you, you know, you are creative, you go away from this solution that the machine tries different paths, but that one solution is still the best. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to go far enough because maybe far out there, there's another solution that's better. Uh, so you have actually in that case also to program the machine in a way you say, all right, I know this solution already. I don't want to have it again. I want to see a different solution. So you have to program the machine, tell it this one's not interesting. This particular one is not interesting. And that's very important. Um, I think in all of these processes where we have to diversify and go in different di directions uh, through the, the possibility of having different groups of ideas that go into different directions. Um, we can discover new things when you imagine this of uh, you know, a cohort of people coming to the ocean, they could just sail in one direction and discover America, uh, but they can sail in multiple directions and uh, then they will need to break up into different groups. 
And uh, this is not all, when this is happening, then I call this uh, diversification. Uh, and that's a very important part because then you can discover multiple things. The risk is also not to discover things, uh, but uh, not to discover anything new, but uh, you have the chance to discover also other things, new things. Um, and so th that's why it's so important for culture, I think, uh, to be diverse. Okay. Um, so thanks, to Danny. There's another question in the chat box from Diana. Um, given the progressive compression of time and space enabled by technology, have you observed that, that cultural clusters tend to slowly become one or reduce their di diversification? And is this a danger for the production of new ideas? So there are things that are constant and there are things that are changing. Uh, what is constant is in a way uh, human psychology to some extent. So at the end of the day, the recipient is the human. And so the human has certain uh, psychological ways in which uh, they're acting, uh, which are more or less between certain limits. Like, you know, I am just 175 tall and uh, the distribution of how tall people are is normal. So it, it just won't, they, they won't be a one kilometer tall person. That just will not happen. Uh, so that's something that's constant. But of course, uh, then because we are so highly interconnected uh, in, through the social media and also because we can see at such a distance, we observe today more easily how this polarization occurs between different groups of people. We can post something today and tomorrow uh, there are a hundred of uh, people who are interested in, and that can go very fast. Uh, there are always existed rumors, uh, disinformation, uh, information, uh, things that are, but it's true that uh, now we can observe it in a, in a, in a different way. It, it's not clear for me at this point which part is just because we can observe it better and the record is becoming better and which is actual change because um, the amount of the, the qualities of the population in a way change we're ha more highly interconnected and so uh, the process could uh, could speed up in certain cases what i would like to do however is um, in many cases, so for example, I've studied with a geographer how um, environmental awareness evolves and it also has to form, it also has to diversify before it, it can start um, creating some sustained uh, awareness. And that very often leads to a time lag from the point where awareness should be there to the point where it actually is there because it has to go through this process of diversification first. And I would really want to hope that we could speed this up so we could actually help this diversification happen earlier. So when you know you're going to a new place and there's new environmental awareness needed there, you could actually speed this process up so that you would have that right away from the beginning. Um, but those are really uh, more questions that will need much more time to solve and uh, to make that possible. And, and um, you know, the way we interact with our environment and the way we think about it uh, and the way we act as a result of our thoughts. Um, thanks, Dan. Maybe yeah. I've, I've uh, of course, go ahead. Well, I just wanted to thank, yeah, for the answer. It's, uh, it's yeah. quite clear. I was just wondering, you know, if we were to do this, uh, say, study in 30, 50, 100 years time, would we, you know, look at a map with uh, much more blurred uh, boundaries? You know, would we just look at one cluster? Like, are we slowly becoming one cluster? That, that was, um, yeah. If we can't get bored, then we would become one cluster, but we can still get bored, I think. Um, but it's a very good question. I like that very much. Thank you, Diana. And also thank you for everyone else for asking these uh, wonderful questions. Uh, it's uh, wonderful. And I'd really be excited to do, you know, that research with you in, in 20 years from now, or uh, to ask someone to do it in 100 years, and I'd be really excited to know the results. Yes, me too, me too, definitely. Well, let's go for this. <laughs> um, then maybe one brief question. Um, 
uh, you mentioned the 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 concept of efficiency or being yeah being efficient and i was wondering um could you say something about the the let's say the relation between standards or standardization um of the built environment or in fashion and your theory or your approach to to the development of um uh, of cultural units um, i'm not sure i actually I, I didn't understand the last part of the question so what do you what role does um, standardization play in the theoretical framework you are developing oh standardization uh, of course um, I think that um, you know things become automatic uh, once they are actually you know we figure out this is a, a way to do and then we don't need our consciousness to, consciousness to do it anymore because consciousness is very expensive it needs a human who feels and uh, who's behind doing that and so I think that's something that uh, has to be treated extremely well. Like if, if do we really need consciousness to do something or is, is that not needed? And if it's not needed, I, I feel we should not use uh, a human to do something that doesn't need a human. Um, and so many tasks are becoming automatic. Uh, and that's always part because even we are automatic. Uh, many of our actions are automatic. Just when I'm speaking now, most of the things I'm doing, the language is, I don't have to think consciously about me breathing while I'm, while I'm speaking. And so these are all tasks that are run without consciousness. And they, we tend to externalize them, get them out of the body. And then suddenly they, they can be done somewhere outside, uh, which is easier for us to do. Uh, and so they are becoming automatized and standardization is part of this, right? Because we've realized this, uh, this standard is just a, a, a very good way to do it. And most of the products will be similar. And then of course, sometimes you need to have a common language like the genetic code is, is, all, is, is the same for all uh, living beings. Um, and th there need to be standards based on which we can uh, exchange with each other uh, information. But then, of, of course, uh, even with standardization, there's always creativity that you create. You start with a standard, maybe, but then you create something slightly new. And that could create, again, uh, a new type of culture where you're going into new directions and discovering maybe a new standard that, in the end, will become ossified. It, it will become this sort of robust thing, this, this solid thing that doesn't need to evolve anymore because it's already uh, it's already sort of solved. Uh, there is, there, we shouldn't uh, spend our consciousness and our evolutionary uh, uh, potential to solve something that's already uh, in a way at the point where we don't really trust that new discoveries will, will, um, will, will change. And so there is the point between uh, investing consciousness and uh, creativity and diversification into something that's actually uh, useful. Uh, it, it, is, it goes into promising uh, directions uh, beyond, say, say, things that are just as good as, uh, you know, you can just standardize them and be just as well off. Yeah. Um, thanks, Dan. Maybe one uh, last question. All right. We're also like, 45 so we should be right actually yeah. just in time <laughs> yeah it's it's uh so thanks again then it was a really uh fascinating talk thanks for sharing your research um uh, as well um and uh, of course thank you mark and samuel for organizing this lunch lecture series um and thanks to to, to everyone who, who who joined us today um I wish you a wonderful weekend um, and um, yeah, be, be productive <laughs> and hopefully see you soon uh, in, in person. Thanks, Dan. Thanks to everyone. Yeah, thank you everyone for joining and my lecture will be online, so I'll keep the link. Yeah. Thank we, you. We will share the link, definitely. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Thanks. <laughs>